things like that. Um, I have sort of a two-part question, if you don't mind, uh, and I want to thank you for being a filmmaker. My younger brother just got out of film school, and there are a lot of uh, new talent coming into the field. But um, in 1979, around the time of the environmental movement, Amory Lovins published his, his major paper that said that nuclear power will never pay for itself, and, and no uh, you know, private sector investment will ever be enough. Because And we've sort of seen that come true, and Avery's every been the guy who came up with this word of um, uh, megawatts instead of megawatts. Right. And he talks also about efficiency and so on. Uh, so I want to book that, bookmark that. 79 with 2013 when former Prime Minister Koizumi has suddenly become a strong opponent of nuclear power and mainly because he traveled to Europe and places where the waste treatment of the legacy type of power plants that we have all around the world, you know, those existing ones, uh, are spewing out a lot of stuff that's very difficult to handle safely as we've seen with the spent uh, fuel rods which are highly toxic and, and so on because of the cascade of of neutrinos and so on in the, in the waste. Mm -hmm. My question is, I understand that this little cube is, is I think the thing is the thorium type of reactor. No. Uh, no. no. It, it could be thorium in a, fa it's a fast reactor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, it, right. uh, uh, actually, no. Actually, no. That's not, no. It's actually, it would be half the size if it was a okay. fast reactor. That's. But would you agree that some yeah. of the uh, hopefulness about nuclear is mm -hmm. this new thorium, which has a lot of advantages and more, more sure. uh, and so on. Um, so my question really is, uh, can we manage a transition to a cleaner, safer nuclear while we have to deal with the legacy problems, including those, uh, the, the containment tanks up at uh, Fukushima Daiichi are full of very hot water. Mm -hmm. You know, can we, can we manage that transition? Now, I know that, yes, it's better than, uh, you know, uh, apocalypse, right? So right. sure, we can, we can, we have to work on it. We have right. to manage it. Right. But do you think there'll be problems as we make any transition? I don't think thorium would be available commercially until 2030. That's Can you right. just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, no. Uh, the 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 uh, the advanced reactor concepts are really what got me excited about nuclear power. Got most of the people in my film excited about nuclear power. Got you know Dr. James Hansen, the world's most famous climate scientist. He's excited about this stuff. Bill Gates is building one. I mean, there's a lot of excitement around advanced designs. And uh, I didn't know very much about it uh, before I started, you know, researching this film. Um, I, I assumed, like most people, that the, the existing light water reactor was a kind of a static technology and there would be some incremental improvements to it, like we improve all kinds of things, but there wouldn't be a fundamental change in the, the reactor concept itself. Um, so, um, uh, the the film uh, spends a lot of time on the the development of the integral the integral fast reactor, which was developed out in Idaho National Labs uh, in the 1980s uh, and into the 90s. Was, the project was canceled in 1994. Um, they were about two years away from commercialization at that point. Um, but that reactor is an advanced uh, uh, fast breeder reactor that does consume uh, waste. So um, and there's many other kinds of things. I mean. Those who are against nuclear technology uh, tend, tend to compare uh, the, 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 what, what a solar panel might or a wind turbine might be in 2025 with what a nuclear power plant was in 1975. And they forget that there's been enormous advancements over the years. I think we have to transition. I think we have to do it responsibly, but you're right. We've lost 20 years in development. These things are going forward. China is leading the world in this. There's thorium is very exciting because you you break that, you know, you don't completely break the connection to weaponry, but you can weaponize with thorium, but it's very, very difficult, very complex. But it's, a, it's an appealing technology, even to many people who are against nuclear power. Um, there's some very interesting things, and it's super safe, and there's super abundant, and you don't have the, you know, you don't mine uranium. Um, um, small modular reactors, uh, all kinds of good stuff that's going on um, that does take care of the waste stream from the current reactors, like the, the, the spent fuel rods at, at Fukushima will eventually be used as fuel in future generation reactors that will be coming online in coming decades, we hope. But certainly, hopefully they come online here, but they're certainly gonna be coming online in China and India. Um, I mean, we have to manage this. I don't see there's been, there's never, nobody's ever been killed or made ill or harmed by nuclear waste so far. Um, but you're right, we got to get it out of those reactor pools and put it in dry cast storage where it's safe and uh, hopefully recycled back and as, as fuel for next generation reactors. Um, but the key thing is the cost. I thought you were going to ask me a cost question. Well, okay, so Amory says it will never pay for itself. 
Yeah. Well, okay, Amory, but it'll never pay for itself because Amory looks at a static universe um, in which everything that he advocates works and everything that everybody else advocates doesn't work. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is that uh, uh, if you, if, let's just take, let's just take um, an example that Amory himself talks about all the time, the world's most expensive nuclear power plant. The world's most expensive nuclear power plant is this one in, in Finland whose name I can never pronounce, Okolino or... Anybody know what the name of that place is? Anyway, it's, it's, like, it's ridiculous. It's a, it's a new a French uh, design, uh, first of a kind. It's billions and billions of dollars over budget. It's years behind schedule. Um, but they're, they're, they're nearing completion on it now. And that's like the poster child of runaway cost. Um, it's been calculated that when that reactor is up and running, because the thing runs for so long, and because fuel costs and operational costs are, are, are negligible on these things, that the electricity from that nuclear plant over the course of a lifetime, over the course of the plant's lifetime, will be four times cheaper than German solar. Even the worst possible scenario is still four times cheaper than, than, than what's done, what happened in Germany with solar energy. So. Um, to me, the, 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 the future of nuclear power is getting away from these big behemoth nuclear power plants um, and, and towards safer advanced designs where you don't need these redundant safety systems, because, which are super expensive because the very physics of it prevent it from melting down. You have a very simple design, modular, you build them in factories on site using off-the-shelf technology and you ship them to, you know, you ship them to, to the site and you bring, make them smaller so you can, uh, businesses could actually enter the market for like a billion dollars instead of six billion dollars. And you can build them modularly out. So I think the future is to imagine um, building nuclear power plants like we do commercial jet aircraft. Um, you build them in factories, standardization, heavy regulation, market competition, um, where you, you not only, by doing that, you not only enhance safety by standardiz through standardization, you also, you also bring down the cost dramatically. And right now, the, 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 the one place where this is really starting to ramp up and happen is, is in China, who are even the, the big light water, advanced Gen 3 light water reactors they're building now, of the similar design that went up in Finland, they're bringing them on budget, on time, and uh, are pushing ahead with, uh, with all these advanced designs. So my big fear is I think we're going to all be buying reactors from the Chinese if we don't get off the pot and get involved in this. Next question. Well, while you're thinking about your next question, I'd like to uh, follow up here. Um, there is a, a segment in the video, in the film, um, where one of the um, activists who has turned and become pro-nuclear, he's up in Fukushima, and he's wearing a suit, and he's um, testing for radiation. And he says, now I'm not so sure if I am. Mm -hmm. uh, pro nuclear. So, obviously, he at this point he he feels there's a high radiation. Uh, the environment has high radiation, and it's making him. He says wobbly. I think. That's right. C could you uh, go into more detail? Right. What, what did he decide on right. later, etc.? You know, it's funny. A, a, a lot of like anti nuclear activists have seized on that is like aha like it's like <laughs> like the film is live television they yes. caught me yes. like I put that in the film because yes. it was true you know uh, it was true um, Mark and Linus and I we went to Fukushima we had to sneak into the exclusion zone um, and we're there with our dissimeter and we know the technology we know the we we understand the science of radiation quite well we know that we're not being exposed to anything that's going to ca cause us any harm Yet, and that's what the rational part of our brain is telling us this, but the emotional part of our brain is telling us something very different. Uh, that we're, we're encountering elevated levels of radiation that were not here before, that shouldn't be here, and the reason they're here is because of that damn nuclear plant that melted down. And that's disturbing. And there are some, there are some quite hot spots, not hot enough to cause us a health hazard, but hot enough that it's disturbing. And I remember one at one point, um, at one point, turning to Mark and asking him if he would, you know, if he would move his children here, knowing that, knowing full well that you could live a perfectly happy life here and not have any health problems, and he said no, and I looked at him as I wouldn't either, and that's a problem, but it's true, um, you know, we, uh, and I think the acknowledging that in the film 
was truthful, and I think it made it a better film because facts, as you said, facts and figures don't tell the story. There's an, we're not robots who simply respond to data. Uh, you know, you input data, an opinion comes out the other end. It, we don't work like that. We're emotional beings, and, and uh, we respond to story, we respond to narrative. We, we, we don't always react, uh, uh, um, we react with emotion to things. And, and so um, it was a deeply, deeply troubling thing. I don't think anybody who has a heart uh, can go to Fukushima and not look at that and just, you know, be crestfallen about what's happened there, uh, particularly if you're someone who is uh, advocating that we need more nuclear power, not less. It's, that's, you know, that's a tough nut. And I gotta say, the same thing when I went to Chernobyl. You look at that and you say, this is just a god-awful mess. It'd be very nice just to say, as Mark does, it'd be nice to say, oh, we don't need it. Let's, let's get rid of this, this is unnecessary. Um, but the fact is, the alternative, we know what the alternative is. The al if you believe the 95 to 100 percent certainty of the IPCC report that came out a few weeks ago, I mean, that's what they're saying, that, that uh, uh, we are heading towards a real climate catastrophe if we continue burning fossil fuels. Because we've got to make this work. We've got to make nuclear better, smarter, cheaper, um, faster, more scalable. Um, we've got to make it work. And I would encourage Japan, um, perhaps, uh, you know, out of, out of, uh, out of every crisis, there's an opportunity. Uh, it's an old saying. I think there's an opportunity here for Japan um, to take what's happened at Fukushima, to take the lessons of what happened, the lessons about safety, the reactor design, reactor placement, regulatory, all of that, which are less hard, hard lessons that have been learned, I, th I think. And to take that and to turn it into something positive and lead the world, use Japanese advanced technology, advanced science, advanced industrial capacity to lead the world with the best, safest, cheapest, most efficient nuclear power plants in the world. I, I think there's an opportunity for that, and if it's forfeited, it's really gonna go to China as it is now. The United States is not gonna do this because we've got so much gas. We're just gonna burn gas for 20 years, and then we'll be buying reactors from the Chinese, probably. But I think Japan's in a unique situation here, um, uh, as is France, to, um, to really push forward. Although France, because of its situation, is more committed to the traditional light water reactors that they're building now. Peter? Uh, yeah, thanks again. Um, sorry if I step on anybody else's ch a turn to ask, but um, we had the governor of one of the Japanese prefectures, in this case, Niigata, uh, which has the largest complex of nuclear power plants, about seven reactors there um, on the Japan Sea side, and the governor has shut them all down and is uh, making it rather difficult for Tokyo Electric Power, TEPCO, to restart them. And he was here at the club and said uh, that I asked, uh, what if you take the the newest of the two, of the seven, the newest ones that are in inland and are really safe and really good. And he said something very interesting. You know, it's not the technology that matters, it's the operator, the quality of the operator, the human, the human element. And TEPCO has proven to all journalists uh, here that they're unreliable and, and uh, have numerous occasions where they've been uh, you know, caught lying and so on. And so he said, uh, you know, that's the problem for me personally as a governor, I have to protect my people here. The people of Niigata, by the way, don't get any power from there. It's all sent to Tokyo. Right. And yet in the last couple of weeks, he's uh, begun to say that if you pass these, these very stringent criteria, we will in fact do what I suggested, take the best two and consider those for, you know, turn on. Mm -hmm. uh, I assume that he sees the consequences of continued import of, of natural gas and, and making gas producing countries uh, rich, you know, Russia, Qatar. Um, so, um, uh, is that a question or a statement? Um, so this question of the operator, uh, in other words, uh, we're now selling them, or Japan is selling them to Turkey, Vietnam, uh, and some other Middle Eastern states, and so on and so on. Do you see that, th that the operator issue can be solved, the human uh, problem? Yeah, well, you have the operator. The, I mean, the human element is in every everything we do. Uh, the human 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 element is in the building of uh, hydroelectric dams, which, if they fail, can cause the deaths of millions of people. Or they're, they're, you know, the 
the human element is in the building of jet aircraft that we all fly on uh, all the time, or at least I certainly seem to in the last few weeks. Um, you know, we rely on high technology all the time. Um, and, and nuclear power is no different from that. Um, but you do need, when you're dealing with complex uh, uh, industrial processes like this that have uh, the risk to, to human health if they go wrong, you need a strong, independent regulatory body to monitor that. Um, you can't let the industry um, run the regulatory body. And I think this is a, a lesson that's come out of Fukushima. It was a lesson that the United States learned um, back in the 1970s where the, the, uh, it used to be the Atomic Energy Commission, the regulatory body and the, and the body that was promoting nuclear energy, were all one unit. It was split off to the NRC um, uh, uh, on the one hand and the DOE on the other, the uh, Department of Energy and Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The Nuclear, Re the nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, in the United States is considered worldwide to be uh, the gold standard of nuclear, of, of regulatory agencies writ large, and particularly nuclear regulatory agencies. Um, it's actually staffed by people who, <laughs> many of whom, and it has been run by people, many of whom are actually really quite anti-nuclear. I've met some of them. But you know what? They do a good job. They do too good a job because they, they prevent, um, they prevent, uh, they don't have the capacity um, to, to approve a lot of uh, advanced designs. Um, however, they do supervise these plants um, very, very well. And I think that's, that's what you need. And I think, as we've seen recently, there's a story out of uh, South Korea, and you know, certain countries don't have that uh, regulatory, they don't have that history of dealing with complex industrial processes and bureaucracy and you know, political institutions to, to have a good, solid regulatory body, which, is, um, which you need. I would like to see this, I would like to see the whole regulatory system internationalized. I think that's the way to do it. Um, I don't think, and I, th I think there's, the good thing about doing that, I've been talking to people at the International Atomic Energy Agency about this, there's a movement afoot to do this. Um, as nuclear power gets ramped up more and more around the world, the Chinese are building, I think they've got 200 plants that they want to build, uh, uh, you know, on the books. I think they're building about 60 now. Um, there's a lot of interest in nuclear power around the world, but there would be an incentive for everyone involved to internationalize the regulatory system because then you could, if you built a plant in, if you built a reactor in, uh, or and designed a reactor in South Korea, for instance, you could sell it, it would be pre-approved saleable around the world into the United States and other markets um, because it would be internationally approved at the highest, highest level. Um, so I think there would be, you know, oftentimes you think internationalization of anything is going, to is going to encounter a lot of national resistance, but I think this is one instance where the opposite would be true. I'm hopeful that that could be true. But um, yeah, I, uh, regulation is, is, is key. Anybody else? Any more questions? Yes, please. Uh, my name is Sri Krishna, and I'm at the Cook Commission, the editorial writer. Um, I, do you know Dr. Lucky? Dr. Naki? Lucky. Lucky. Yeah. No. He proclaims that you know, 100 million civil a year is um, you know, not only bad for health, but good for health. Oh, yes, yes. So that, there's a, uh, Dr. And Wade he, Allison. He did yes, a, too, in, yeah. in intensive research at the, uh, you mm -hmm. know, those who suffered in uh, yeah. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you know, his theory is true, then we, we, we didn't you know, need any evacuations. In fact, uh, you know, over 2,600 uh, 2, people died. I think because of the evacuation, not because of the radiation. Right. So, uh, if you know his theory is true, you know the whole entire picture of evacuation, the safety, the fear of the uh, radiation, all that would be quite different. So, I just wondered whether you know you think his theory is true or not. You're not a scientist, but I'd like to hear your opinion. Yeah, it's a really interesting. I've read a lot about this. There's another. Um, there's a, another person, Dr. Wade Allison at Oxford University, has just written a book about this. Um, I don't want to tell you guys something that you already know because I know you're all covering Fukushima, but I'll just go through it real quickly. The, the whole reason why so many people have been evacuated from Fukushima and the whole reason why the exclusion zone is so big, and the same thing with Chernobyl, is because of this thing called the linear no-threshold theory. 
um, which came out of the studies of the, 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 the survivors of the atomic bombs at uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where we, they was able to very carefully uh, pinpoint how much radiation people were exposed to. Um, and we know that at a certain level, you will die. At a certain level, you will get cancer. We know that. Well, you, and so what they did was to just to, to do a baseline for regulatory, uh, 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 to re for regulations for human exposure uh, of radiation around the world. They drew a graph like this. They knew that this, this much will kill you. They draw a straight line into the corner on the, on the assumption using that, there, that there's no safe threshold for radiation and that so if a lot will kill you, a little will kill you proportionally less, right? Um, uh, the problem with that, I mean, it's, okay, it's fine if, as, as, as a very, very simple way just to make sure that people aren't exposed to you know, excessive levels of radiation and industrial processes and things like that. It doesn't really matter because nobody's exposed to any dangerous levels of radiation. We're all, there's background radiation. But it doesn't really matter until you have an accident like Fukushima, where you suddenly get, an, uh, uh, you're going from where you were to suddenly there's an elevation. And, and if you follow the linear no threshold theory, that elevation will give you a proportional increase in cancer. Well, since 1945, uh, where uh, the, the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki has been studied for decades and decades and decades, we've learned more and more and more about the, what the long-term effects are. Uh, and, and then Chernobyl happened, and we have another case study, uh, uh, which was a release 10 times greater than Fukushima, as you know. We have another case study. We've had 25 years of studying the epidemiological impact of the people at, Fukush uh, at, the people at Chernobyl. And what, it has been, what has been uh, uh, theorized has actually been proven to be true, is that there is a threshold that below which, so a lot of radiation will kill you, and a certain level of radiation will get you sick, but below a certain level, and it's estimated to be around 100 millisieverts a year, um, there doesn't seem to be any harm. Any, there's no statistical evidence from the examples that we have in the world um, that anything lower than that has any statistically significant increase in, 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 in cancer, mortality, birth defects, anything. And 100 millisieverts is a lot. It's a lot. Um, and there's a lot of confusion about this. Again, I, I brought this up. I screened the film in Vienna at the IAEA, and I brought this up. I was like, you guys got to get this together, because you've got the United Nations Commission, uh, the United Nations uh, Committee on the um, Special Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, which is the supreme body in the United Nations that studied the, 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 the uh, uh, victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki all these years, they have recently abandoned the no-threshold theory based on the evidence that they see before them. So they think that the, they agree with what you're saying, and, um, that, that, that there is a threshold and that this is a false measurement that's just causing a lot of turmoil. Unfortunately, the World Health Organization is not yet taking that step. They're looking into it, um, but because they haven't taken that step, um, uh, uh, when, when, when uh, looking at the, the, the potential health impacts of uh, uh, people at Fukushima, even with the linear no threshold theory, they're finding almost none, almost like a, 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 a potential increase in cancer mortality that is statistically invisible, but is potentially something. Um, uh, but that potentially something is enough to terrify people. And you're quite right. If you really look at this rationally, probably the best thing for everybody, not for everybody, but the best, the best thing for probably 90% of the people who've been impacted by, uh, uh, who've lost their homes um, as a result of Fukushima would be simply to move them back. And that their, their lives will be better, their health will be better, their sanity will be better, um, everything will be better. But we do have this problem of the psychological aspect of, of fear, the news media, um, and this confusion over linear no threshold theory. So it's a, one of those situations where the science is very difficult to communicate. That's interesting. And then you're right that there is a lot of very interesting science that, that suggests that when you get down to low level, low level increases in radiation, there actually may be some health benefits because it does, radiation does have the, the effect of speeding up the repair mechanism in the DNA. Our DNA is constantly repairing itself all the time. Repair, repair, repair. Ra low level radiation actually appears to speed that process up. And there's been a lot of interesting studies. You know, it hasn't been actually proven, 
you know, I wouldn't make that case in a movie, but it's interesting. I, I find the science very interesting. Yeah. Any more questions? I was hoping there'd be some here who would be very anti-nuclear, who would ask some really tough questions. Um, I wonder, Robert, if you could tell us, people have seen your film, mm -hmm. and um, we saw in the film there are some very passionate anti-nuclear um, activists. Having seen your film, what um, arguments are they? I'm sure they're not being convinced. So what arguments are they pointing to to either criticize the film or to say, hang on a minute, there's another story here? Right. Almost all the criticism of the film has come from people who have not seen the film. They don't like the idea of the film, the very concept of it, the very fact that it exists pisses them off. And they don't like it, and they've written lots of nasty things that you can find all over the internet. And they've accused me, they say it's a propaganda puff piece. Uh, I'm just a propagandist. I'm a bought and paid for tool of the nuclear industry. Um, all of this stuff. It's just stuff, right? Um, then there are the people who've seen the film who are either professional anti-nuclear activists or they're journalists who have staked their careers on an anti-nuclear position. Um, and they don't like the film and they've tried to come after me and they say they've never been able to pin any factual information uh, in the film as being wrong. They've tried, um, but they're they've been continually shot down. Um, but they do say that I've been unfair, that I've only told one side of the story, that I haven't told their side of the story, um, et cetera. So it's all been very um, emotional, even in the level of attack, uh, and not very specific on the facts of the matter. Um, um, but that's, uh, that's to be expected. I actually have been really surprised at the positive response I've get, gotten. Those people, when I've shown the film, even in, among audiences, and I've polled them before, even among audiences that are overwhelmingly anti-nuclear, at the end of the film, they have changed their minds quite dramatically. And I've even had, I've even had uh, people who have picketed the film, and I've invited them in. And it, I'm not saying that I've won these people over, but I've had good conversations, and we've shaken hands, and they've actually gotten excited about new generation reactors because they didn't know about it. Um, because all their, this, they operate in an information bubble where all they ever hear is this negative thing. And they go, oh, really? There's like another perspective? It's opened their minds. So once people see it, um, it's had a very, very different reaction. And once people meet me and they understand that I'm not, you know, a zealot and a, I haven't been paid for, I'm doing this, whether they agree with me or they disagree with me, when people meet me, they understand that I'm actually sincere in what I'm saying. I'm not saying this because I'm, you know, being paid to do it. I'm not. Um, I'm saying this because I believe that this is a way forward out of the climate crisis, and that we need to look at this technology. We need to make it better. And whether people agree with me or they disagree with me, I think they appreciate that. And I've had many people who still remain anti-nuclear say that they thank me for making this film because they think it's a dialogue that we environmentalists need to have. Uh, I can't tell you how often that's happened. So. It hasn't been as con nearly as contentious as I thought. And th for the people here who haven't seen the film, um, you mentioned CNN may be broadcasting it in early November. How about um, if they want to go to the cinema and see it here in Japan? <laughs> My distributor. <laughs> I'm the, I'm the distributor. Uh, distributor uh, in Japan that uh, of the film, uh, so uh, uh, we are now the scheduling the uh, uh, the uh, road show that uh, from the uh, you know coming February, you know, uh, in the whole uh, whole you know Japan. And so uh, you know, firstly that we start uh, the road show in Tokyo, so. Uh, but uh, before that uh, we. Uh, uh, we carry out the uh, more premiere uh, to the um, uh, medias, so uh, that uh, you know, uh, I will let you know that if I uh, get a, uh, if I can get uh, your cards or something like that, your business card. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there'll be lots of opportunities for you to preview the film, and then it's going to be uh, opening in February, right? And it'll be out on DVD after that. And oh, yeah. yeah, right. So. 
Well, the CNN broadcast is only in the United States. December 3rd. And maybe the final question then. Um, I recently bought a very expensive uh, mirrorless camera that, which you can take great video with. And I had dreams of um, really getting into video and making movies, long, long range dreams. Um, but I found how difficult it is. Having watched this film, I was watching it also from a sort of filmmaker's perspective. And there were so many cuts and B-roll and um, different interviews, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, please give us some idea of uh, the amount of work you put into this and how long it took, uh, mm -hmm. this kind of thing, from, from your uh, ma movie making experience. Well, it took me three years to make the film, and, and Fukushima happened in the middle of it. Um, but uh, uh, I knew that this film needed to be it's a, it's such a um, it's such a difficult subject. Climate change is just a subject most people just are bored with and are close their minds to. Energy just seems sort of a dry thing. Mm -hmm. uh, nuclear power. Well, the only interest, as I said before, the only interesting uh, story that to tell about nuclear power in itself that would really get people excited would be to to, to tell something about how absolutely terrifying it is. Um, um, so the, the trick to me as a filmmaker was how do I tell the story? And so at very early on, uh, I felt that the story should reflect my own story, which is coming from a perspective of being against this, uh, and as the baseline for what people are, are, the questions that people have going into the going into a movie like this. But it had to be a personal story of uh, a, a personal journey. Of, and, and so I found it's, the film really focuses around five people who came from very different walks of life, but who were all very anti-nuclear. And they explain why they're anti-nuclear. The first third of the film really lays out the case against nuclear power. And then one by one, we go through the issues that are most uh, of, uh, of, uh, of front and center of people concerned about nuclear. Uh, uh, power, you know, the safety issue. Well, okay, well, what about the safety issue? Let's take a look at Three Mile Island. Let's take a look at Fukushima. Let's take a look at Chernobyl. What really happened? We go to these places. So I traveled. I had to travel all over the world to make this film. Um, uh, what is the what is the uh, uh, what is the, the the future of energy demand? Um, so going to um, not only going to Tokyo, which was a great place to look at. Um, how uh, uh, advanced developed nations, you know, consume energy is a colossal city of 30 million people. But I also went to uh, uh, places where they have no electricity at all, and to see what their life is like, and 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 places that are crawling out of uh, crawling out of real destitute poverty. Um, and uh, you know, what about the waste? So I went to I went to um, the the place in France where they store all of their radioactive waste, and I went to Yucca Mountain and. Uh, um, so on and on, I went through the, the big questions that everybody has and went face to face personally into these places. And I think the, the, the most, um, and filmed it. And you know, the, 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 the most uh, impressive thing, uh, or the th put it this way, the thing that can impress one the most about this source of energy is simply going and seeing it. Go into a nuclear reactor, go see the people who do this. Go see the people who run these plants. Talk to them. Go and see for yourself. And this thing that that seems like this sort of mysterious source of energy that's behind these barbed wire fences and has all of this um, mystery to it actually just becomes very real. There's, you know, there's this people get up in the morning, they go to work, they work at these places, and they they deal with running these plants. They deal with the waste stream. It's it's being managed, and by and large, it's being managed very well, and it's quite impressive. Um, if you, but it, it, it and it takes the mystery out of it. So I had to do a lot of traveling, a lot of shooting. Did most of it myself, with the advanced uh, uh, technology of the new these new cameras that John mentioned. Um, you know, I could just put on a backpack and grab a tripod and head out to the airport and go anywhere in the world and come back with beautiful looking footage. It's uh, a great and wonderful thing you couldn't do a few years ago. So it was a great, great adventure, and um, I had a wonderful time making it. I see we have one more question, please. Robert says he has uh, the time, so yep. let's, let's make use of it. Yeah. 
Please speak into the microphone for the recording. Uh, my name is Kurt Sieber. I'm an associate member of the club. And uh, what I wanted to ask you, whether you see a possibility to show the film here at the press club. If we have an excellent movie committee here, where we always have kind of sneak previews, and uh, I think for, and particularly for films which are controversial and sometimes have difficulties to get into the regular theaters just because of all kind of pressure against them. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, I suggest that you take this up and uh, uh, we hope to see the whole film here and uh, I think this will be a good starting point for getting it shown all over Japan. Great. There's nothing I would like more. Thank you so much. Yeah, Thanks. Taka will, uh, yeah. Yes, we'll that, 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 that's yeah. a great suggestion. Thank yeah, yeah. you. No, that's a great suggestion. Yes. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Robert. And we, um, the club, as always, for our guest speakers, we'd like to present you with a one-year honorary membership of the, of the club. Please come again. And perhaps um, when the film is being shown, you'll be asked more challenging questions at that time. All right. Thanks so much. Yes. Appreciate it.